There are two common ways to utilize daylight in buildings. The first way is an architectural approach for daylighting to reflect the daylight off of carefully located and shaped surfaces so as to create a visually dramatic or pleasant scene in the indoor space to serve architectural philosophies. The second is energy saving and minimizing CO2 footprint and view to provide adequate natural light for visual tasks and minimize the need for electric lighting, thus saving energy. Let's study six great examples of this use of daylight that have been designed by real masters of daylighting. The first example we will look at is Abu Simbel, located in Egypt. It is believed that the axis of the temple was positioned by the ancient Egyptian architects in such a way that on October 21st and February 21st, 61 days before and 61 days after the winter solstice, the rays of the sun would penetrate the sanctuary and illuminate the sculptures on the back wall, except for the statue of Ptah, the god connected with the underworld, who always remained in the dark. These dates are allegedly the king's birthday and coronation day respectively, but there is no evidence to support this, though it is quite logical to assume that these dates had some relation to a great event, such as the Jubilee celebrating the 30th anniversary of the pharaoh's rule. In fact, according to calculations made on the basis of heliacal rising of the star, Cirrus, Sothis, and inscriptions found by archaeologists, this date must have been October 22nd. This image of the king was enhanced and revitalized by the energy of the solar star, and the deified Ramesses the Great could take his place next to Amun Ra and Ra Harakthi. Due to the displacement of the temple and or the accumulated drift of the Tropic of Cancer during the past 3,280 years, it is widely believed that each of these two events has moved one day closer to the solstice, so they would be occurring on October 22nd and February 20th, 60 days before and 60 days after the solstice, respectively. The NOAA Solar Position Calculator may be used to verify the declination of the Sun for any location on Earth at any particular date and time. For the latitude of Abu Simbel 22 degrees 20 minutes 13 seconds north, 31 degrees 37 minutes 32 seconds east, 22.33694 degrees north, 31.62556 degrees east, the calculator will yield values close to minus 11 degrees for both October 22nd and February 20th. This is a real masterpiece of daylight without using a computer or having the possibility of earning lead points. The next example is the Pantheon, located in Rome, Italy. The interior of the dome was possibly intended to symbolize the arched vault of the heavens. The oculus at the dome's apex and the entry door are the only sources of light in the interior. Throughout the day, the light from the oculus moves around this space in a sort of reverse sundial effect. The oculus also serves as a cooling and ventilation method. During storms, a drainage system below the floor handles the rain that falls through the oculus. The next example takes us to France and the Ranchamp Chapel. In the interior, the space is left between the wall and roof, as well as asymmetric light from the wall openings serve to further reinforce the sacral nature of the space and buttress the relationship of the building with its surroundings. Our next example is the Kimball Art Museum located in Texas. David Brownlee and David DeLong, authors of Lewis I. Kahn in the Realm of Architecture, declare that in Fort Worth, Kahn created a skylight system without peer in the history of architecture. Robert McCarter, author of Lewis I. Kahn, says the entry gallery is one of the most beautiful spaces ever built with its astonishing ethereal silver-colored light. Carter Wiseman, author of Lewis I. Kahn, Beyond Time and Style, said that the light in the Kimball Gallery assumed an almost ethereal quality and has been the distinguishing factor in its fame ever since. Creating a natural lighting system that has evoked such a claim was challenging, and Kahn's office and the lighting designer Richard Kelly investigated over 100 approaches in their search for the proper skylight system. 
The goal was to illuminate the galleries with indirect natural light while excluding all direct sunlight, which would damage the artwork. Marshall Myers, Kahn's project architect, worked with several experts to determine that a reflecting screen made of perforated anodized aluminum with a specific curve could be used to distribute natural light evenly across the cycloid curve of the ceiling. His team used a computer to determine the exact shape of the reflector's curve, making it one of the first architectural elements ever to be designed with computer technology. In areas without art, such as the entry hall, cafeteria, and library, the entire reflector is perforated, making it possible for people standing beneath to glimpse passing clouds. In the gallery spaces, the central part of the reflector, which is directly beneath the sun, is solid, while the remainder is perforated. The concrete surfaces of the ceiling were given a high finish to further assist the reflection of the light. The end result is that the strong Texas sun enters a narrow slot at the top of each vault and is evenly reflected from a curved screen across the entire arc of the polished concrete ceiling, ensuring a beautiful distribution of natural light that had never before been achieved. Next, we move on to Seattle, Washington and take a look at the Chapel of St. Ignatius. Seven bottles of light in a stone box. The metaphor of light is shaped in different volumes emerging from the roof, whose irregularities aim at different qualities of light, east-facing, south-facing, west- and north-facing, all gathered together for one united ceremony. Each of the light volumes corresponds to a part of the program of Jesuit Catholic worship. The south-facing light corresponds to the procession, a fundamental part of the Mass. The city-facing north light corresponds to the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament and to the mission of outreach to the community. The main worship space has a volume of east and west light. At night, which is the particular time of gatherings for Mass in this university chapel, the light volumes are like beacons shining in all directions out across the campus. The Mount Angel Library in Oregon is one of Alto's few designs in the United States. However, his same consideration in the surrounding nature and incoming daylight still remains strong. The clerestory that he employed in this design allows for the building to receive as much light during the cold winter months while saving itself from the heat during the summer months. This method, seen mainly throughout the second half of his career, is yet another technique of bringing in diffused light, which is better for reading and studious environments. Since the library is a large three-story building, Alto designed a double-height space on the first floor, which allowed light to trickle down to the darker floors. He also used horizontal windows with louvers to provide sufficient light to those areas farther away from the clerestories. If visual tasks can be efficiently performed without consuming electricity and producing the attendant pollution and carbon dioxide emissions, the building is more sustainable. Further benefits are produced and are credited in the energy and atmosphere and elsewhere in the indoor air quality sections of the LEED rating system. The Telenor office building in Norway has glass walls, which very efficiently minimize the need of electric light during daytimes on working areas. Another strong benefit resulting from the use of windows to admit daylighting is that it allows the occupants to have a view to the outdoors. Music